This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. We welcome you to this post-Alberta election debate edition of Real Talk, where we recap the way that it went down, some of the nuances, some of the more obvious observations, and ultimately, whether or not last night's clash between NDP leader Rachel Notley and UCP leader Danielle Smith will move the needle at all on voter intention. Did any viewer or listener to that debate change their mind? We're going to welcome in three people who... Well, I've made a career of convincing people they know what they're talking about. They're the hosts, the co-hosts of one of Canada's most popular political podcasts, The Strategists, and we can't wait to get into it with Annalise Klingbill, Stephen Carter, and Corey Hogan. This episode of Real Talk is presented by our friends at We Know Training. You can find them online at weknowtraining.ca. You know, learner fraud, forged certificates, and uncredentialed workers pose significant risks to organizations, potentially resulting in legal liabilities, reputational damage, and quite frankly, a workforce that lacks the necessary skills and qualifications to succeed. That's why it's absolutely critical to partner with a trusted provider like We Know Training. At We Know Training, they're dedicated to helping organizations mitigate these risks and build a competent, skilled workforce. Their industry-leading learner verification and digital credential solutions enable you to easily verify learners, issue and share credentials, and set up automated reminders to make sure that your workforce remains compliant and up-to-date. By partnering with We Know Training, you can save valuable time and resources, reduce administrative burdens, and ensure that your organization is always one step ahead of the competition. So why wait? Contact We Know Training today to learn how they can help you take your workforce to the next level. Stephen Carter, Corey Hogan, and Annalise Klingbell form The Strategists, one of Canada's most popular political podcasts. We're excited to have them hanging out with us on this Friday as we recap last night's debate, the first and only televised debate of the 2023 Alberta election campaign. To the three of you, welcome. A happy Friday morning to you. Carter, that sly grin makes me believe that you've already got something up your sleeve and we haven't even got started yet. You know, you know, Ryan, every every time we sit on hold and wait for you to get through the commercial break, I think, how can that guy whore himself out? So- <laughs> hey, we're not cutting off your audio. Yeah, that's your Stephen shitty microphone. That's not, that's not, that's not, hey, you know what? If you had advertisers, you oh, could no. afford better microphones and then you'd be able to <laughs> oh, deliver no. your zingers in better fashion, pal. Yeah, he's, you know what, classic Stephen Carter, uh, coming in strong so there, Stephen. Yeah. So typical, so typical. Annalise, Annalise, Hi. so good to see you. Thank you Me for too. making yourself available. Did last night's debate move the needle at all on voter intention? Yeah, I, I, to be determined. I mean, I think talking to people in the NDP camp, they obviously think Rachel won. Talking to people in the conservative camp, they think Smith won. But when we talked about it last night on the podcast, these two think it's kind of TBD over the next few days. And and I would agree. And even looking at the headlines this morning, right? Like, no clear winner. This is about trust, that sort of stuff. We're going to see that narrative come out in the coming days. Corey, what's the goal of, of, of each leader? What's the goal of each team? Obviously, there's a lot of prep that goes into this. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of thought on the shallow stuff, but maybe we don't overlook that. I mean, is it worth pointing out that that both leaders, uh, you know, were, were, were wearing the same color, that both of them were wearing blue? I mean, is that worth pointing out? I mean, take us into the, the behind the scenes strategy and, and how this stuff, how these leaders are prepared heading in. Yeah, I mean, the reality is, just to be blunt, a lot of voters are shallow. So they are interpreting how the debate goes through some cues that perhaps we would wish they would think better than, but they do. They're like, ah, I like that outfit. I don't like that outfit. I like that hair. I don't like that hair. I like how they're looking at the camera. What in the world is on on Danielle Smith's nose? Is that pen? Like, these are things that people actually talk about when they talk about and deconstruct the debate. In some ways, much more accessible than saying, I don't know, like, do we believe that $170 billion number or do we think it was 160 or 150? Like that, that's not very accessible unless you happen to be having coffee with, you know, Trevor Toome and uh, and the like. You're simply not going to have that kind of conversation the next day. So 
big time that stuff matters. It matters a lot. And and the fact is, a lot of people also don't race to the Google machine after and proof all of these things, you know, fact check all of these things. And and they're going to do it much more on Vibe. And I think the fact that they do it so much more on Vibe is actually one of the interesting stories of this debate, because arguably, Danielle Smith crushed it on Vibes. And arguably, um, not so much on facts, but will people matter? And and so whether she's held to account for that is part of why I think me and Steven and maybe maybe even Annalise will find out because she's she's answering questions today. Think that it's going to take a couple of days really to determine how this debate went. Yeah, this is always the fun part of having the strategists on Real Talk is that Annalise uh, and or Zane Velji get to answer the questions instead of ask them, which is always nice to kind of turn that around a little bit. Carter, your day job, you're the president of Decide Campaigns. You've you've you, you've essentially quarterbacked a ton of campaigns um, yeah. and a whole bunch of different levels of government. What was one key thing heading into the debate that you were keeping an eye out for? What was one thing you were waiting to see if it would happen or not? Well, I was wait, waiting for the kill lines, right? I was looking for the, uh, you know, this is something that we talked about a lot. You know, you're going to prepare X number of lines. You're going to have them ready to go. And Notley really had some kill lines ready. I didn't think she went all the way with, like, when she was talking about, do you really want to go to talk about your candidates, Danielle? Do you really want to compare your candidates to my candidates? Yeah, do that. How about if we actually do the comparison? How about if we start talking about the the woman that day who'd just been kicked out of the caucus. Why not put Danielle Smith on the defensive and say, are you going to let her into the caucus at any point during the year? Or are you going to say, you're not in my caucus for the entire duration of this term. You will never, ever sit with us if we win. Okay, How Carter, let me jump in for a second because because we actually have that audio. Okay, let me play yeah. it for the audience yeah. and then we'll get into it. This is the moment in that debate that Stephen Carter's talking about. I've been in office since 2008. I have never actually breached the conflict of interest legislation. Ms. Smith cannot say the same. Well, okay. I guess I guess you're you did have an MLA who hacked our health care system. I can I can tell you. Do you that really in, in, want in to ML- talk about can, our I candidates can tell you. and our MLAs? Well, like I, seriously, I do I, not I think you're going to win that one. Yeah, I mean, that I is have to not tell you, one you want to do. I have to tell you, when we're putting <laughs> together our affordability payments, to have to ask whether it was going to be hack proof from the NDP, that's not something that Ms. Notley should be very proud of. Okay, Carter. So there it was. How should Rachel Notley have played that? I think I would have gone with you. I literally had to kick someone off your team today. You know, last week it was someone else. You know, like there was a list of MLAs that have gotten into trouble. Smith herself has had to do a blanket apology. I've never seen so many blanket apologies in an election. It's like, you know, you're all buying those bay, those bay blankets and that's how you're doing it. Everybody's everybody who does a blanket apology gets a Hudson Bay blanket. Like, what are you doing for free gifts or something? It's utterly ridiculous. This, how this is all working. And, but but Notley had lines. They just weren't kill lines. They were good lines. They just weren't absolute killers. Annalise, let's talk about this. This is the Jennifer Johnson story. And most people that are paying attention to Alberta politics are well aware of, of what this is about. We discussed it on our episode yesterday with our group chat roundtable. This is the Lacombe Pinocchio candidate. Uh, uh, I mean, she'll show up on the ballot as a UCP candidate, but Danielle Smith, a statement yesterday says she won't sit in the UCP caucus. Now, I think anybody with half a brain or an awareness of how politics works, and I'm not comparing the situations, but Rachel Notley did the same thing with Deborah Draver when she was elected in 2015. I'm not comparing the situations, but after a while, when the dust had settled and when the fire had had quelled, oh, we got to be careful with our fire metaphors right now, but you get the point. Uh, Notley welcomed Deborah Draver back into the NDP caucus. I think everybody assumes at some point that Jennifer Johnson, I could be wrong, is probably still going to win and at some point will probably still be welcomed back into the UCP caucus, especially if the seat count is tight. But how do you think Danielle Smith could have handled that better? Or what's your assessment of the way that she did via statement yesterday? Well, the statement took two, three days. Like when when were we first talking about this was a few days ago. Um, it, it took way too long. The, the, the comments that I, I think it's worth people reading the actual comments. They were absolutely disgusting. They were harmful to a group of kids that already has higher suicide rates that is already at risk and it, it took a few days and she she did it and and um one might say she saved it to do it on the same day that the ethics commissioner report was coming out that found her that she had she had um, breached the conflict of interest rules so i think uh i i think the fact that it didn't happen immediately 
And then it happens on the same day. And you saw those reporters yesterday saying like, hey, it's only 10 o'clock and we've seen this and this and this. Oh, and it's debate day. Like the pace at which things are happening is is absolutely nuts. And the fact that it just kind of got, you know, looped in with this other busy day is, um, I, I mean, obviously they did that on purpose, but she she should have walked away. She should have distanced herself from that candidate immediately, in my opinion. Corey, I, I, think, I think both candidates did all right in the debate last night. I think that they both performed all right. But to be honest with you, and, and Annalise has kind of alluded to this, I think with the scandal going on in Lacombe, Pinoca, and, and I think with the Ethics Commissioner report and everything else, I actually think Daniel Smith kind of got off easy last night. Don't you? Uh, big time. I, we said this on the pod last night, but for me, the surrealness that was hanging over all of this is we had a, a premier who was found guilty of an ethics violation by the ethics commissioner, uh, you know, unequivocally so, no, no matter what Daniel Smith said during the debate, it, really clear, really stark language called that type of action a threat to democracy. And we're just having a nice, normal debate within the nice, normal confines of debate protocol. And part of me thought, what are we fucking doing here? Like, how is this conversation not immediately? Question one, what is going on? Let's get down to the bottom of this. Let's talk about this. But instead, it was like the train was on the track and the candidates had their lines and the candidates had their responses and the moderators had their questions. And we were just going to do it. Yeah. We we're just going to do it no matter what the events of the day were. And that was nuts to me. And, and I think that one of the challenges for me with this particular debate is that it all just sort of floated into this inconsistency of the presentation of stakes that's that's kind of underpin this entire campaign. We have these moments where we talk about these, you know, systemically bad moments, right? Things we've never seen before in terms of interference in the justice system or uh, the Alberta Sovereignty Act, which we all seem to have forgotten about. That was only a couple of months ago. And we're just kind of, we're frogs in water. We're just talking about it in our normal ways. You know, we're going through the normal beats that you see in a campaign. Yeah, And we are in a severely unnormal moment. I want to give a shout out to Keese Den Hartig, who's let us know in the live chat that they're tuning in from Brussels, which is very cool. I want to thank Tony for the underhanded compliment. I'm here for the strategists. Um, <laughs> and someone so, else. Who, <laughs> we're, he, we're big in Brussels. I, I should, I should, you know I should let you Brussels. all revel in the compliment for yeah. a second. Uh, but, but there is a comment here where, where somebody says, and I apologize, the, the, I don't have it in front of you. Someone says that there wasn't exactly that math is hard or that look in the mirror moment, that sort of iconic statement. Let me put this in front of you. Could it potentially be grainy versus high definition? I know Ms. Notley likes to show grainy videos of things I said while I was on radio. And uh, the reason she does that is she doesn't want to run on her record. And the reason she doesn't want to run on her record is it was an absolute disaster. She racked up $70 billion in debt, more debt than any premier, all, actually all premiers combined in Alberta's provincial history. She, talk about deception. Did you remember her running on a carbon tax in the last election? I sure didn't. And that increased the cost, the cost of everything. We eliminated it, but Justin Trudeau wouldn't let us keep it off. And now uh, Ms. Notley has not stood up to her boss, Jagmeet Singh, in Ottawa, and uh, worked with us to say, don't increase that, that carbon tax any further. And in fact, certainly don't increase it 300%. No one has any credibility talking about affordability, as long as they support a carbon tax, which is going to increase the cost of everything. Uh, Ms. Smith, I'm sorry. You talk about grainy videos, but actually we had high definition 18 months ago when those videos of you arguing for people to pay for their health care came out. And you know what? We had high definition when you said you wanted to sell our hospitals across Calgary. And you know what? We had high definition a week ago when your deputy premier said that he thought people should pay to use the emergency room. Carter. Was that a score? Was that a bullseye? Was, was was that a direct hit? I mean, I think that both of them did very well in that exchange. I think that that exchange did, you know, got their message across and made it very uh, easy to see, you know, what their positions were. And, and uh, uh, you know, I, 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 I struggle with some of the language that Danielle Smith uses because I think that she's, uh, you know, lying, uh, to be honest. But that is a, that's part of her rhetoric. And then, you, you, if you're Notley, you're trying to come back against that, and it's really tricky. But Notley's comeback was just as was good, uh, as, as good I think, as Smith's uh, attack. Both of them were thrusting, parrying, and, try, and trying to figure out how this would actually work out in the end. And they, there was a big fight. Keep in mind, we've never seen a two-person debate in, in, in Alberta. We rarely see them in Canadian politics. Uh, in fact, this might be the only two-person debate that we've seen in this 
at this level uh, for for decades. So this is one of those. It was really good to be able to see that immediate pushback, that immediate fight, and as a result, I think it muted a lot of the attacks uh, that were that were pushed. There were no big lines like that. Uh, you know, math is is. Corey will correct me. Math is hard. It's actually math is uh, difficult. Yeah, difficult. Yeah, Just thanks, Corey. The record. Yeah, no, because you're there to be uh, pedantic. Um, <laughs> thank you. I mean, every good round table needs at least one person sticking to the facts, at least one. And so, Corey, we thank well, you doing, for that. Who's doing in this one? Well, yes, not it, not uh, it. Yeah, not okay. it. It's gotta be hey. Annalise, I guess. Uh, now I know that uh, there was there was a moment, as far as I can tell, at least based on your tweets, Corey Hogan, that that really annoyed you, uh, and that came as a result of a question from an Albertan uh, that wrote in, and this is nothing against the Albertan, and I'm not looking to pick a fight with Alex, uh, but Alex submitted a question, I think, along the sort of peace and love kumbaya lines. Here's one of the co-moderators. Aaron Isfeld reading the question. Here are the responses, and then we'll put it in front of Hogan. Alex says, please tell us one specific policy your opponent has put forward that you agree with and why. Ms. Notley. Well, you know, that's a really good question. And, and I will say this, and I've said it before. It's actually two. I'm, I'm going to go with two. So, uh, you know, uh, very early on in the UCP mandate, uh, it was under the former Premier uh, Jason Kenney, they introduced the uh, Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Corporation as a means to uh, expand Indigenous participation uh, in our economy. We like it. We're going to expand it, and we're going to expand uh, the number of opportunities uh, that, that would qualify for that kind of support uh, with Indigenous communities across the province. Another one was uh, they expanded uh, uh, funding of uh, the film and TV tax credit. And that was a good idea. It's, it's, it's brought more excitement into our industry. We will absolutely maintain that, uh, and we look forward to it. All right. Thanks very much, Ms. Notley. Ms. Smith, once again, uh, specific policies that you agree with mm -hmm. For the NDP. I'm very proud of both of the uh, the initiatives that, that Ms. Dotley mentioned. The uh, Indigenous Opportunities Corporation has been so successful, I think, in addressing true economic reconciliation. And the film and TV tax credit brought the last of us here, which I think all of us feel pretty excited when we watch that um, on the big screen. What I, I think uh, Ms. Notley and I would agree with is that we know that there are a number of doctors who are now wanting to specialize. And I completely understand. A lot of uh, time goes into becoming a doctor. Doctor, and so we're seeing fewer doctors go into family medicine. And so we, I think we would both agree that we need to move towards team practice, that we need to make sure that we've got team practices for family doctors to work with nurse practitioners, LPNs, and other health professionals to ensure everybody gets the health care they need without having to pay for it. All right. And that was also the voice of Scott Roberts, co-moderator. We wish him a happy 40th birthday. Corey, why do you hate that question from Alex so much? I hate that question so much because there are thousands of things that these two people agree on. They, you know why we don't talk about them? Because they agree on them. And the election is not about things we agree about. So why don't we talk about the things we don't agree about? And yeah, there are going to be people who say, oh, but you learn about their character. You find out if they're nice or they're mean. No, you find out who's faster at being a calculating genius here. Because let's talk about this. Let's deconstruct this a bit. There's been a lot of commentary about, oh, Danielle Smith didn't answer the question directly. Rachel Notley gave us two. Isn't Rachel Notley so nice? Well, Rachel Notley gave us two things that were not about Danielle Smith, that were about Jason Kenney and his particular government. Danielle Smith immediately understood that, which is why she gave her preamble about how much she liked them to try to take credit back for them. And then she talked about a health care policy that she basically wanted to get a key message in on rather than subject herself to the question. All anybody is ever doing in answering this question is trying to find the most backhanded compliment or the way that they can elevate their own key messages. This is not actually about what they agree with. And you know what? That's fine. I don't need to hear what they agree about. That's just totally fine. There's a million things they agree about. I worked in the government. 90% of the files, they're going to be treated the same whether they're UCP or NDP. It's the 10% that matters. Decisions are made at the margins. Let's spend some time at the margins, not on this kumbaya shit. Annalise, uh, Andrew Coyne, one of Canada's most prominent political commentators, immediately tweeted about that exchange. He said, name a policy of your opponents that you agree with. Notley names a couple straight up, says they were good ideas. Smith spends the first part of the answer, repeating Notley's answer, then names another policy that she thinks the NDP would agree with her on. Just utterly classless, says Andrew Coyne, not to say shameless, who then goes on to say, alas, I fear that type of shit works. 
Is Coin on to something? Was it classless by Danielle Smith? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of agree with what Corey's saying. It was a it was a bad question. It wasn't a necessary question. And there weren't a lot of questions. Like we talked about this on the podcast. It was a short debate, right? There was two of them. It was an on, only an hour. I think a lot of people thought it was going to be a little bit longer. And it started and then it was done. Um, so it wasn't it wasn't a great question. And to Corey's point about character, where a question like this is an opportunity to show character we know both of these people like Rachel Notley was premier for four years. She has a record that people understand. She achieved things that people understand. Smith has been in the public eye for years and she's been premier for six months. Right. So we, we know what, what their character is. And I just think it was kind of a, a waste of a question, to be honest. Uh, Carter, would you have advised a candidate in that circumstance to, to play by exactly what Corey's book would suggest to say, Hey, listen, I appreciate Alex's question, but we're going to agree on 90% of the stuff, and that's not what people care about right now. Would you advise your client to swerve away from the question like politicians are so adept at doing? Yeah, I think that Daniel Smith actually did the best job on that answer. Um, you, you, know, you, you can't humanize and say that, you know, you can't say that Daniel Smith is going to be bad for Alberta. And that's basically the NDP's entire um, advertising pitch. And then you come back and say, uh, but, you know, there, here's two things that I agree with, not just even one. It's two things I agree with. You start to humanize and say, well, the risk of choosing these people isn't as big as we thought it was. What Danielle did by taking a policy of hers and then equating it to a policy of the NDP is saying, again, look, we're so similar. We're very much the same. You can choose me and it will, it will be safe. I'll, I'll even take that health, that crazy healthcare idea that the Rachel is doing, and I'll, I'll incorporate more elements of that into my own into my own election campaign. Yeah, let's talk about that. And that's what made Smith say, okay, I'm actually not sure that, I think Rachel Notley did win the exchange because I think she was quicker on her feet and she she gave the non-answer backhanded compliment in a way that was a little bit less overt. But Danielle Smith said, if I'm going to agree with the NDP on anything, it's going to be healthcare because that's what Albertans trust the NDP on. And that was smart. Like you could see those wheels turning as well. It was kind of the execution on which Danielle Smith failed, but um, she, she certainly was going at it the right way. But all to say, like this was not about what policies they like. This was not. This was for both of them. This was an ability to continue to drive their key messages forward and do it in a way that, you know, frankly, the public would give them credit for being nice about it at the same time. And that's that's what I think is the shame of that question. If you want to find out if there's nice if they're nice people, there are more direct ways that you can ask questions to find out if they're nice people. Mm. On the live chat, I like Jen says this time around though, there's so much polarization. I actually kind of liked that question. Final buzzer says they say that every time they've been yeah, saying Jen, that my whole life. My how whole life fucking they've been elections saying that. is Jen will. What 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 fucking <laughs> credibility has Jen got? Does Jen have any fucking For fuck's credit? Sakes, like, Carter. Is Jen Jesus, on the Stephen, fucking shots show? Fired. Is Jen on the show? So is she a guest? I don't know, but you might be Jen. you might be you might be starting something right now with Jen. You might oh. be coming at you strong. Uh, Jen Jen, well, I got your back. Oh uh, yeah, we all got we got your back, Jen. Oh, look at who wants to be Mr. Nice Guy. Yeah, well, <laughs> hey, Answering when opportunity question. presents itself, take it. Uh, yeah. final <laughs> buzzer says town halls with pushback are more informative than debates. Emma says I thought it was nice to get the briefest reprieve from all the flame throwing. I'll be honest, I tune into debates for the flame throwing, just being honest. Yeah. Uh, but there was a moment of, of humanity or an attempt to connect with the human element. And I'm going to put that in front of Stephen Carter first in just a second. First, I wanted to let you know that this episode of Real Talk is presented by sponsors like Athabasca University. That's Canada's open university. And Athabasca U is designed to fit your life. For ambitious people everywhere looking for more flexible approaches to higher education, if you've been thinking about going back to school, whether it's an undergrad program, maybe a master's or even a doctorate program, there are dozens and dozens of great options for you. And the best part, the only commute is to your device. The Athabasca University experience is different from other universities by design. They're more accessible, more flexible, more equitable, and more personalized for everyone. You can get started today at Canada's Open University by visiting AthabascaU.ca. Do you have barbecue plans for the May long weekend? We know that there's fire bans in place. We know that your plans may have changed. So why not keep it closer to home with a chicken and ribs combo? Make it the best May long weekend ever with our friends at 
Friesen Brothers. You can check out their flyer online at Friesen.com, including what our family loves, the Family Essentials Flyer. It's quality food for low prices every day. They even have recipes in there developed by their Red Seal chefs at Friesen Brothers. It's never been so easy to make a healthy and affordable meal for your family. Friesen Brothers, for more than 65 years in 16 Alberta communities, they're Alberta-owned and Alberta-grown. Hey, are you involved in the energy business? You're looking to the future and you want to be a part of Canada's sustainable energy goals? I had a chance to spend some time with Kubi Renewable Energy CEO Jake Kubiski yesterday. I just love his story. A longtime oil and gas electrician who transitioned over to solar. He's now leading the charge with Western Canada's busiest solar installer. You know, they're proudly working in Alberta, Northwest Territories, uh, Saskatchewan, and BC, and they're hiring right now. Spring is obviously the kickoff to their busiest season. If you're an apprentice, if you're a journeyman, if you'd like to help Canada get closer to its green energy goals, why not check out the careers link today at kubienergy.ca. And of course, it makes sense for us to mention the way the forecast is looking in our neck of the woods this weekend and probably yours, that the summer blizzard treat menu is officially out at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. That's Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, and Baseline Road, where you can pick up returning favorites and new flavors like the Caramel Fudge Cheesecake Blizzard Treat. Yeah, this is the one that blends indulgence with innovation, creating a true cheesecake experience with salted caramel truffles, cheesecake pieces, and caramel topping blended to perfection with their world-famous vanilla soft serve. Make sure you check out May's Blizzard Treat of the Month at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. Our guests on this Friday roundtable here on Real Talk, it's Annalise Klingbeil from Champion Communications. And I want to talk about your sub stack for just a quick second as well. You're doing amazing work in the great outdoors. Stephen Carter from Decide Campaigns and Corey Hogan from the University of Calgary. We should mention, of course, you can also get your strategist mug. I'm assuming, guys, on your, on your website, is that right? The strategist.ca? Yeah, you can go to westofcenter.ca west if you'd Center. like to get a oh, okay. strategist yeah. mug. How yeah. did you convince West of Center to sell your merch? <laughs> Uh, it was more it's public broadcaster you, anybody can ask that's a misuse of Very public funds is what that is listen it fell up it, it fell off it, it fell it became available ergo Corey immediately moved and bingo bango we got ourselves some uh, some merch okay all right there buddy. all right good stuff and of course people can check out their real talk mugs under the merch link at ryanjesperson.com carter you specifically asked us to pull a clip uh, it was about 40 minutes into the debate, uh, the debate when Rachel Notley talked about a hypothetical, uh, but it's probably played out many times in an Alberta classroom. Here it is. I have watched for four years with great alarm what the UCP has been doing to our school system. I imagine a six-year-old child uh, in grade one uh, in a class that unfortunately has 28, 29, 31, 32 children in it, and she puts her hand up to get help, and she waits for a minute two minutes, three minutes, and nobody comes. So she puts it down, and it happens a few more times, and she stops trying. Over the last four years, we've had 35,000 net new children enter our schools, and the UCP have not hired a single new teacher. In fact, they fired some, and they also fired about 10,000 educational assistants by tweet. Carter, why did you want that clip pulled? Because this is something we've been talking about on the, on the pod for months stories. The, how campaigns are won and lost is stories. And the characters on this particular play of watching us, you know, watching this debate of Danielle and uh, Rachel, they're a little bit difficult for us to interact with. We're not going to be leaders, but we are all parents. We are all parents. Well, not all of us, but many of us are parents. We are all children of, of, of parents. We understand the pressures. And when we start to equate things with stories, People understand them better. And that was the only story in the debate. And as a result, it was, I think, a breakthrough moment in the debate. If, if Rachel Notley had used another story about health care, uh, Danielle tried to use a story about paramedics, you know, the dump and drive. 
we now dump our patients in the hospital and we are able to drive back out and get more patients. That's actually the policy that the UCP have put in place. doesn't feel like a great policy to me, but Danielle tried to brag about it. Good for her. Um, the good, I'm really pleased for her. But this is, we react to story and in an hour of talking, we had one. And yeah. that to me is a real failing on the part of both of these leaders. Yeah, it's, Annalise, it's really go ahead, surprising. Go ahead. Well, look, it's really surprising because stories are such a fundamental component of political conversation, political communication. And the reason is narratives are a hack. Narratives break through defenses. They they allow you to get a different part of your brain going and you don't have the fight or flight. I'm going to argue with you about the statistics. You can put yourself in somebody else's shoes and you feel what they would feel at that particular moment. And I got to tell you, I have a six-year-old child and that hit me. That story, I thought, oh my God, yeah, like that is actually what my child would do if he put his hand up many, many times and nobody ever came. He'd just stop and he would say, well, nobody ever comes and he would get frustrated and he would get sad. And that makes me sad. And the fact that they didn't use storytelling like that more often, I think was a real miss for both of the candidates. The 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 way that you can use a story to get past defenses and, and try to imagine the things that you would otherwise kind of just wish away or statistic away uh, is, is really something. And the example I always tell people when I talk about this is a certain vintage of Albertan will remember Barb Tarbox and the, the anti-smoking campaigns around that and uh, how she would talk about you know, the end of her time coming sooner than she wanted it to and how she wouldn't be there for her children. And as smokers can sit there and say, well, yeah, you look at the statistics, you're not actually going, you know, probabilities aren't, you aren't going to get lung cancer, you know, it's not going to be me, I'm healthy. But to see somebody go through it and to put yourself in their shoes, that's so powerful. And the fact that both leaders seem to use that tool so sparingly is, is, is like really surprising. And, and a time when we talked about this on the podcast, like a time when there's so many stories, healthcare, an issue that the NDP absolutely owns. There's been four years of stories on that file, right? Um, so yeah, I, I would agree with both these two that that, that opportunity to story tell, it just, I mean, it's like comms 101 and it wasn't there. Yeah, Annalise, and I, I think it's kind of interesting because Danielle Smith's playbook on this has been just to say, yeah, Rachel Notley and I agree on healthcare. Like, yeah, we agree on healthcare, and 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 then it just seems like the conversation kind of moves on. And and I've been waiting, uh, and 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 that's not the first time. The debate last night is not the first time that the UCP leader has said that. She's been saying mm -hmm. it on the campaign trail as well. And and I've been quite surprised to see Rachel Notley hasn't said, "Excuse me, hang on a second, stop the bus, stop the train. Where exactly do we agree on healthcare? Because I'm not sure they agree on much." Yeah, exactly. And that, that was Carter's point yesterday. And he got quite angry in the podcast, but about, about the lies, right? Of like, you should have in Carter, you can tell it, but like to have not like counting the lies and the things that came out of Smith's mouth that weren't true. Let me just tell you how happy I am to have my words used and, and credited to me. Normally when Zane's on wow. the pod, he just takes, <laughs> takes uh, them. Takes yeah. them and then just very says classy. Their own thoughts. Very classy. So, well, Zane Zane believes in a remix culture. Nothing is actually copyrighted. It's all public domain. When said, yeah, yeah, it's all public domain. It's who he is. We miss we miss him, but uh, Annalise is you know pretty smart, so we're she's pretty okay. happy to have her. Yeah, she's okay. Um, yeah, I mean the, the pushback, the opportunity to push back from Rachel Notley about Danielle Smith's alternative facts was missed. And we discussed a number of different ways on our podcast that it could have been could have been grabbed. But the bottom line is uh, too many statements were put forward by Danielle Smith that went unchallenged by Rachel Notley. And I'm not sure why that is. Uh, there was some interesting discussion today uh, from, from some journalists about whether or not it's the pressure uh, you know, if, of not coming across um, as a bitch, right? Because the pressure on female politicians is different than the pressure on male politicians. And that's true. And, and having worked with so many women in politics, it is much harder. And I suspect that both teams uh, didn't want, you know, the, the the traditional word that is used is shrill. You know, no one wants to have that ap applied to them. And it makes it so much different, so much more difficult. Uh, and I, I wonder how much that actually played in this debate and how hard it was for both the leaders and their debate prep teams uh, to get around that type of uh, let's just say bullshit uh, critique that comes at the comes from the from from Corey and I's gender uh, more than more than it possibly should. Annalise, but, but, what do you think even about in, that? 
Well, even, even in what they were wearing, right? Like the, mm -hmm. I saw so many comments. I had texts about it. Why on earth are, are they wearing the same thing? They're wearing the same color, that sort of thing. If it was two dudes in the same color suit, people wouldn't be talking about it, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's very true. Well, can we, I know we already kind of touched on that a little bit. Um, and, and, and people might say that, you know, we acknowledge off the top of the show is in the first five minutes, we talked about the, the hair and the, and the outfits, but like, that does matter. Like I personally love Steven Mandel, but like in 2019, the suit that he wore in the debate was an absolute fucking disaster. And, um, <laughs> and people that were on that Alberta party campaign team are still sore about that. Like outfits matter, haircuts matter, like yeah. facial expressions matter. Um, Annalise, am I reading into to it too much or any like both of them wearing blue like I understand a conservative wearing blue to have an NDP leader wear blue am I reading too much into it or what do you think I mean I I, th I think you are I don't know if you're reading too much into it obviously it was an intentional choice and the teams make decisions about what to wear but again to my point if if it was guys we wouldn't be doing it the same way um I said like was Rachel Nolly going to show up in an orange suit no she wasn't going to do that so I think blue was blue was a safe color um, but like is she and... trying to but like is she I guess what I'm saying is like is she trying to subconsciously like I put a lot of thought into it like to be honest like a little peek behind the curtain like when I moderate election debates when I sit on an election panel I wear a little bit of blue and a little bit of orange. I do. When I'm talking about federal, I wear a little bit of blue and a little bit of red, whether it's a pocket square or not. Like, it's just subtle little things. And I wonder if the public, you know, you don't even have to think that the public's going to notice it. It's that they don't notice it, but their subconscious registers it. You know what I mean? Carter's nodding his head, yes. Well, we, we've done, we, we, we spent quite a bit of time on our Patreon episode on Tuesday, which $6 is still available for download if you join the our. Uh, strategist podcast Patreon account. <laughs> yeah, uh, the strategist.ca. Yeah, only six dollars per month. Uh, unbelievable. For the price details. of a latte. So much, so much better than the Ryan uh, real talk feed. Obviously, well, this is where I got to stop you, Carter. I mean, I, I, I will, I will let you whore yourself out on our on our show, but once you start straying yeah. into our lane, that's when it gets. You know what I mean? Yeah, he's just pushing oh. where the boundaries are, right? Yeah, he he's just testing it out. He's like he a child, see, you, you know, know, the first yeah. time it, with access to the kitchen cookies. You know, I get Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah, I get yeah. it. Yeah. We know training as well. and You uh, stay away <laughs> from we know training. <laughs> uh, just, just saying. Which is some good work. Listen, uh, I mean... I don't remember what my point was going to be, Ryan. You fucked We were me, talking so about not... colors that people wear and subconscious wardrobe no, choices and... Body language in general. Right. So what am I wearing? How does my hair fall? We talked about the hair falling in, in Rachel's face and not falling in Danielle's face. That makes a difference. Right. Uh, if someone has to play with their hair, I don't ever have to, but others do. Um, you know how that hair is, is managed. It means something. Right. If 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 I let my hair get long, I, I turn into Krusty the Clown and, and I can't do that. So what we do with our our, our presentation matters. Our body language matters. And that. I'm not sure that, that both leaders, I mean, Danielle Smith is just so comfortable behind the camera. I mean, she's been 20 years uh, in, in front of the camera, 20 years standing in front of a camera, make, you know, making her point and reading lines. And, and that was very, very clear that she was comfortable there. That was the body language speaking to us. That wasn't her voice. It was her body language. And that body language is, is going to be something that people respond to. Uh, I'm not sure how they're going to respond to it. I know how I responded to it. She actually pushed me away a little bit, but that's because I know the tricks and the tools that were being used. I'm not sure that everybody else does. Uh, we've got a, a whole bunch of people on the live chat that are saying they see it. Like this is like Tracy and, and Jen and MA. They all say that they associate blue with Alberta, mm -hmm. with the Alberta flag. So maybe that's why they were both wearing blue. Public safety is an issue that is on a lot of people's top three priorities, uh, things that they're paying attention to, you know, basically party positions, platforms. What are these two parties going to do about a, a, a dramatic rise in violent crime rates in the major cities and in rural areas, including some uh, prominent and, and high-profile disasters, some tragedies over the past while, uh, including on public transit? And the leaders addressed this. Defund the police came up a little bit last night, less than I thought it might. Here's the clip. I was pleased to see that Ms. Smith uh, made the announcement to restore the funding uh, to uh, uh, police officers at the 
I was pleased to see that Ms. Smith uh, made the announcement to restore the funding uh, to uh, uh, police officers that the UCP cut at the beginning of their term by hiring the extra 150 officers. We matched that, uh, and then we also went further and said we would also hire 150 more social workers, mental health therapists, those kinds of folks. We would uh, t to help uh, uh, with with social disorder on our streets because we know that's worrisome to people, very worrisome. We also, however, have committed to uh, restoring funding for affordable housing. Under the UCP, we've lost 8,000 affordable housing units and a further 4,000 people were cut off of shelter allowances. And that level of homelessness has created a real crisis contributing to the concerns around community safety. All right, Ms. Smith, your time. Well, first off, we wouldn't defund the police. Uh, again, Ms. Notley has uh, so many defund the police candidates on her platform, on her candidate roster. I've lost count of them as well. The, the frontline services are demoralized, and we are giving courage and confidence back to our frontline officers. We've embedded sheriffs in both Calgary and Edmonton. We've added, we're adding 100 police officers in both Calgary and Edmonton because we believe that people have a right to take public transit and feel safe. They have a right to go downtown and be able to have a nice dinner or see a game and not worry that they're going to be randomly attacked. And they certainly have a right to walk past an open doorway without having to inhale secondhand crystal meth smoke. We have an approach that is going to make sure that we crack down on public safety and crime and make sure that people feel safe again. I think that secondhand crystal meth smoke was trending on Twitter for a while <laughs> after yeah. that. Uh, Carter, who had the more compelling argument there? Well, I think that Smith had the more compelling argument because Rachel didn't push the actual point, which is uh, the UCP actually cut the funding. The UCP have been in government for four years. The UCP are the ones who have allowed this situation to happen. That's the fucking point. You know, don't tell me about the mental health for officers or people that you're going to hire. That's not actually going to change my vote. What's going to change my vote is the UCP allowed it to get to this. The UCP are the ones are the authors of the current situation. And if you want the current situation to remain, keep the UCP. If you want to have an actual chance at changing it, elect the NDP. That's how debates are supposed to work. But Notley is so comfortable talking about policy. That's what her her number one thing is to go back to policy. I've got great policy. No one elects people on policy. We elect people on, yes, you're I'm better than that person. The per reason we have this problem, the reason we had to send sheriffs in to solve this problem is because the UCP created this situation. They were the ones who began the cuts to, uh, to our police services, and then they slid the money back in just before an election, hoping you wouldn't notice. Well, we noticed, Danielle. We noticed. Annalise, you're nodding. Are you surprised this hasn't been a bigger part of the election campaign to this point, a bigger part of the discussion? No, I mean, cr crime's hard. Like, I, I was um, press sec for the justice minister, for Kathleen Ganley, NDP justice minister, when rural crime was, like, a big issue. Mm. It's, a, it's a hard issue because it's so personal. And it, you, it's hard to argue with someone when they don't feel safe, even if it's not accurate, right? Like, even if someone lives in the suburbs and they never go downtown, but they can say, well, I don't feel safe to go downtown. Um, I think I think crime crime is a difficult, it, it's, you're, you're dealing with people's emotions. Um, but to Carter's point, there's a track record that you can point to, right? Like the UCP have been in power for four years, this didn't, this is this, you can't blame this on the NDP. They've had four years to fix this and it has not been fixed. That being said, is not a unique to Calgary Edmonton problem. Like we're seeing this post pandemic across Canada on transit systems, mental health. And it's not a simple, there's no simple solution here. It's this like multifaceted approach. Um, but I do think having someone say like, I don't feel safe taking my family downtown, that it, it, that is, it's, it's, it's a strong thing when you're dealing with how people feel about their safety. Kathy on the live chat says, why aren't they talking about the root cause of crime? Right. She says poverty, like who created the perfect climate for poverty and houselessness that from Kathy in our live chat. I do think Rachel Notley, she, Rachel Notley talks about affordable housing. She talks about that. Corey, you just raised your hands. What did you want to say? Carter well, almost I, fell off his chair. Yeah, there. Carter almost <laughs> fell off his chair. I mean, I guess the thing is, 
Yeah, that is absolutely something people should deal with. But the root causes are going to take a little bit of time to work through the system. And if you feel unsafe now, it is deeply unsatisfying to hear from a politician. Yeah, yeah well, we're going to deal with, uh, you know, universal preschool, because we've seen longitudinal studies that show 30, 40 years later, you're far less likely to commit crimes. Very true, by the way, probably the best investment we can make is in early childhood learning, if we want to deal with crime as a root cause, a long way away in terms of seeing the results of a program like that. And and we can't hand wave this away. We can't say, oh, but the statistics show it's not as bad as it is in the 90s. Oh, but you know, whatever. The reality is there's real safety and there's psychological safety. And at the very least, I think we have to concede there's a big erosion in psychological safety. Mm -hmm. And psychological safety matters. Psychological safety is important and it does need to be addressed. Corey, when you're saying that, are you talking about psychological safety? Are you talking about the perception of feeling safe or am I missing the mark? No, that's that's it. And, you know, it's also it, it there's there's variants of it. And there's manifests of it. And it can be as simple as I don't feel very comfortable walking by somebody laying on the street. Right. And and I could see a crack pipe. And that makes me feel like there's a certain lawlessness that has taken over downtown. And that lawlessness makes me think I myself be, might be a threat. That's a reality. That's a reality politicians have to deal with. And they can't just say, yeah, but the stats say you're OK. Like th- that that guy's not going to do anything. You're fine. Like, wh- what are you worried about? That Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to see it retreated into statistics. So one of the things about the crime conversation, um, by the way, Stephen, she did push the point. The very next clip, if, if uh, Ryan had let it ke- keep running there, was Rachel Notley returning to exactly the points you wanted to make. But one of the things in this debate is, well, they're happy to point at each other and say they're the reason for the problem. They're both pitching the same solutions, right? Uh, varying degrees of emphasis, you know, whether it's on prevention, whether it's on wraparound supports, or whether it's on police on the street. But they're all suggesting all of that, and um, and I think one of the challenges with having this conversation overall is it lands more on what you think about these parties and their brands than it does on the actual things that they're saying. Interesting comment here from Jillian in our chat. She says this election is a test of Alberta IQ. It's about who's been paying attention and who understands how we got here and who's not and who is happy to be fooled. That might be the case, but that that's setting a high bar for elections. I, I, I've often said the great thing about democracy is that everybody gets to vote. And the worst part about democracy is that everybody gets to vote. Carter? Yeah, I mean, a benevolent dictatorship with me and Hogan at the, at the helm is probably our best <laughs> chance moving forward. Um, but you know, I, I want to return back to, to Kathy's point about the the, the, the you know the um, getting to the root causes. I mean, people don't understand the root causes, right? Kathy might understand it, Jen might understand it, maybe Kathy and Jen should put to get together and start their own uh, political consulting service. But this is a real false consensus effect. If you actually think that people are going to be thinking like you do about how we should really address crime and its issues, um, poverty is of course part of the problem, but it's it's you know, it's mixed up with drug addiction. It's mixed up with homelessness. It's mixed up with all kinds of different issues and societal things that are real and we can't separate. But politics and elections, if you'll allow me to Kim Campbell here for a second, this isn't the time to be talking in big, broad sentences about the issues and, you know, trying to you know work out these things. Pol- scientific papers are written to try and understand these things. Political campaigns don't understand things. They solve things. And they and they relate things to us in simple story, and that's what the, the, that's what you know. I did a story about how I, on a pod about how I was walking past people who were you know shooting up, and how that made me feel. I wasn't unsafe, but I felt unsafe, and that is what is being described by both Rachel Notley and Danielle Smith in this clip. Neither one of them, I think, gave us the real sense that they were going to solve the problem. Uh, I don't think that you can get to solving sometimes. I think that sometimes the furthest you can get is blame. And that's part of politics, too. I don't know if Jean's on to something here. She says both leaders wore blue because it was Catholic World Education Day and school communities were encouraged to wear blue. The color blue stands for piety and sincerity and an association with Mary. Interesting. Jean's doing that crystal meth and got some of that secondhand smoke. That's what happens. Is, to just before our time runs out, Carter, is there any other audience member you'd like to pick a fight with? Uh, just I would I would hate to leave any opportunity untouched. 
I'm pretty good. No, you're good. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I do like this note as well from Alyssa, who, who notes that she joined the chat late. Uh, but she says, has anybody asked or has anybody touched on the fact that like this or wondered why this debate was held in a storage closet? She says the entire setup was like from 1999. Um, Alyssa, I'll be honest. I thought it looked Bush League. And that's uh, not a shot at the people moderating it. Uh, they're both personal friends of mine. They obviously had nothing to do with it. But I thought it looked cheap and terrible uh quite frankly i think our set looks way better and 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 that's thanks to our sponsors and advertisers steven and we're going to mention them in just a second but i will note did you notice a conspicuous absence uh you know Daniel Smith's still fighting with the CBC, right? You did have a CBC journalist yeah. on the panel asking questions. But as far as I understand, this debate, this televised debate almost didn't happen. And I wanted to get the three of you to, to chime on in this at the end as we sort of wrap up with, with, with general thoughts moving forward into the last 10 days of this campaign and, and ultimately leading to Election Day on Monday. Uh, but like Daniel Smith is still threatening that the deadline has come and passed. The CBC didn't apologize for their story about her or her staff approaching Crown Prime prosecutors she's threatening to sue the cbc she hasn't done it yet people are wondering if that's going to happen there's the ethics commissioner report which is obviously quite damaging and i think that that'll probably continue to land as the ndp drops more bombs over the next week we can probably expect that both parties are still holding back a few damning videos or facebook posts i mean calgary fish creek i think is probably paying attention to their conservative candidate down there i haven't seen that facebook post so i'm reserving comment it's all allegations right now but if they're true, that guy's in a world of trouble for his comments on black Albertans. Um, Annalise, uh, what do you make of what's still to come over these next 10 days, how you think they're going to play out, and ultimately what the end result's going to look like? Well, we, we also have, um, and maybe this has happened and it's just been lost in the shuffle, but remember that candidate who made the blanket apology for like, and you, Carter and Corey complimented on the podcast, the idea of this blanket apology. This was before Daniel Smith's blanket apology, but made like a blanket apology for, hey, sorry for anything that's about to come. I don't think anything from her has been um, made public yet. So yeah, I mean, it's been like, it's been a crazy first couple of weeks. It feels like as someone who pays a lot of attention to this stuff, it's hard to keep up with. It's been nonstop. And I think we're going to continue to see that um, in the coming days. We're going into a long weekend, obviously. So I think people will be with friends and they'll be with family and they'll be talking. And then it's kind of the home stretch next week. Carter? Yeah, I mean, I think that the debate's not going to have the same impact it would have had if this was before Thanksgiving. We talked about which we which you know long weekends in a municipal campaign, that Thanksgiving long weekend when all family gets together and kind of sit around the, the table indoors because you know it's October and no one goes outside in October. Um, those are those are meaningful weekends. Lots of votes change. I'm not sure that the same thing happens on May long when everybody hops in their trailer and heads out to the campground. Uh, you know, maybe maybe those campground conversations are going to be about Danielle Smith. Uh, and Rachel Notley, but I suspect they're going to be uh, about other things, especially given the temperature is going to be 28, 29 degrees. Yeah. Hogan, last word to you, pal. Yeah. The, you know, voter sense making is a curious thing. How voters decide to vote for somebody is a curious thing. The job of political parties is to to make stories that make it all make sense for them. And right now, I think the NDP have put a lot of things on the table. But I think they're just ramping up into their trust arguments to make them more clearly as it comes along here. The challenge for the NDP will be in such a target-rich environment not to lose focus on the big things that really matter. If they present too many, people are going to tune out. They're not going to be landed. They're not going to be able to be processed. The UCP have a different problem. The UCP need to create a sense that uh, you know they are the ones who can manage the economy and that the economy is the number one concern at this particular moment. And they've got to stop getting knocked off course by their own activities, whether present or past. And, and the last week has to be error-free ball for the UCP, and it has to be tight storytelling for the NDP. You can uh, follow these three on Twitter and make sure you check about uh, check out Annalise's uh, Substack. It's awesome. Go outside.substack.com. Uh, Annalise, we grind your gears in our in the DMs because you're always out in the mountains, and so you take longer to respond than anybody else. Uh, but but you provide. I, I, I have a life. <laughs> you have a life. <laughs> Shots fired. Uh, off, you what? have a life <laughs> offline. That was for Carter. Corey's <laughs> <laughs> got a life. He's got three kids. But yeah. in all seriousness, I love what you're doing. 
doing with Go Outside, and, and people can check that out. We'll put it in our show notes on the podcast and on YouTube. And friends, be sure to subscribe to the Strategist Podcast and do support them on Patreon. They do a, a great service and obviously wildly entertaining. You can learn more about what they do, including maybe upcoming live events at thestrategist.ca. Carter, Hogan, Annalise, thanks for doing this. We'll talk to you again soon. See you later, bud. You got it. This conversation happens because of sponsors like Apex Automation, and we love what they're doing right now. Uh, heard from Adam Berlinick, uh, who's uh, one of the co-founders of that company. This guy is just salt of the earth, and he reached out to me just a few days ago to let me know that they're expanding uh, to a field office in Houston, Texas. Why? Well, number one, because there's opportunity down there for them. Number two, because some of their existing team members were looking to pursue personal opportunities down there, but they didn't want to leave the Apex team. And so Apex Automation is working with them to open an office in Texas, so it's a win-win for everybody. You find me another automation firm that's doing that. How cool is that? Apex is currently hiring right now. If you're an electrical engineer, an instrumentation engineer, a computer science engineer, a process engineer, a mechanical engineer, electrician, instrument technician, you get it, right? If you want to work in emerging fields like autonomous vehicles and machinery, advanced process controls, they're hiring right now. You can check them out online at apexautomation.ca. You know, I take a little swipe at the terrestrial broadcasters for that Bush League set last night. It's because we're especially proud of ours. This set here was built by the team at Complete Care Restoration. They came into a 110-year-old space. You know, there's no straight lines in a building this old. There's some water leaks, though. They fixed it all. They buttoned it up, and we're so thrilled with the outcome. Complete Care Restoration does construction and renovation, but the majority of their work is helping folks recover from fire damage, flood damage, and nasty stuff like mold and asbestos. If that right now is giving you a pit in your stomach, there's one call to make, and that's Complete Care Restoration. You can find them online at completecarerestoration.ca or give them a shout at 780-454-0776. And our friends at Eden Landscaping want to remind you that their team is now full speed ahead you know they spend the winter talking to clients working through plans blueprints and of course doing all the business stuff so they can bring out the boots and the shovels and everything else and bring outdoor spaces to life once the ground thaws they're now full speed ahead on custom landscape builds including retaining walls water features irrigation and drainage issues what about planting and removal could your space use a brand new tree and not one of those ones that needs 30 years to grow up how about an outdoor kitchen everybody seems to have an outdoor pizza oven these days you can work with eden landscaping by checking out landscapeedmonton.ca figure out what it means to work with an exceptional landscape designer that takes your project from start to finish that's the family-owned business, Eden Landscaping, at landscapeedmonton.ca. Great panel today. Great Wasn't panel. that good? It was so good. Carter I, comes in and just picks fights, which yeah. is kind of his calling card. Can I ask a question? And I know you're a suit guy. I'm not. Huh? What was wrong with Stephen Mandel's suit in that? Oh, man. I don't know. Here's a, a picture. I got one. Is oh, this the one, one you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, but you got to. Yeah, it's just it, it's. Let me go in closer. It just here. didn't Hold work on. for everybody on the podcast. And like, let me be clear. I love Stephen Mandel. Yeah. He's a personal friend of mine. And we've joked about this, but it was an ill fitting suit. Is it cheap? He's not wearing it. It's it annoying is? Mandel. It's not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> but Stephen Mandel, he's not wearing a tie at all. That's, Stephen yeah, Mandel's that's... signature when he was the mayor of Edmonton was looking sharp, mm -hmm. was looking good. He had his signature bow tie. He had his signature kind of funky glasses, his funky frames, you know? And mm -hmm. he just didn't deliver And Kenny that and the other night. guy look slick. Like, they look very... Kenny and the other guy. <laughs> yeah. Can we call him hundred bucks, 100 bucks if you know who that is. He's been on Real Talk before. Do you know who that is? He's a lawyer. He's the former leader. Johnny's giving me the uh, the throat, sl not the throat slash move. That was a harsh way to put me. You're giving me the like change the subject body language. That's former Alberta Liberal leader David Kahn. Yeah, David Kahn. Yeah, that was. 
Oh yeah, 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 David yeah, Kahn. Yeah, the, well, the photo was a bit grainy. <laughs> yeah, it, is. it was a bit grainy. No and then of course Rachel Notley there. Yeah. Uh, that was her. That was her second of three debates. She's mm-hmm. been in three now. Daniel Smith's now been in two after last night. Twenty twelve was her last debate as leader. But I of see the what Wild you Rose. mean. Like the other guys look very, very high. So like, tight. where's Mandel's bow tie? Why isn't his blazer done up? Why is he wearing like a muted gray and just blends in with the podium? Look at Kenny. Power black suit, yeah. blue conservative tie, right? Look at Notley. She stands out with that bright pink color. Like, it's just, this is stuff. I know that people might roll their eyes. This stuff matters. Mm-hmm. Like, when CEOs get hired onto new corporations, especially if they're new in the role, they get an image consultant. Almost mm-hmm. every political leader has an image consultant. It's so important whether we like it or not. Mm-hmm. Especially, you know, a lot of people watch the news now with the volume turned off, right? Totally. Captions. Have it going on in the background at the airport or wherever else and if you look like hell people are going to perceive you to be not up for the job yeah and we always have captions on here at real talk there's, there's a big shout out yeah hey that's a great point hearing to make, impaired Johnny. or anyone who wants to listen uh we've always got captions on you can just hit the cc at the bottom yeah love that on youtube that's mm-hmm. a great point to make Every Friday, our friends at Local Environmental Services give us a chance to blow off a little steam. You know, it's uh, essentially real emails uh, from uh, viewers and listeners like Tanya and Ned who have something to say and they want thousands of people to hear it. It's a tradition we call Trash Talk! All right, this one from Tanya, who says, uh, good morning. I love everybody always starts their trash talk so politely. Good morning, says Tanya. Uh, Yesterday, Thursday's roundtable, the group chat roundtable on Real Talk, watching four progressive conservative friends chat about the election was fascinating and aggravating all at once. I've never considered myself a partisan, and I struggle to understand how this is so fucking hard for decent conservatives to work out in their minds. For those struggling on where to place their vote, a wake-up call, please. The NDP messaging is weak. They lack a message of hope and a compelling narrative. Daniel Smith is a smooth communicator in debates. Who fucking cares? From a place of love, truly, your personal relationships and history within the conservative movement are clouding your minds. You need to be objective and clear-minded and understand when your loved ones need a timeout. Over the past several years, the UCP has denigrated to the point where... Oh, jeez, I got fired for saying shit like this, Tanya. The monkeys are running the circus. Candidates, the board, local constituencies, chock full of conspiracy-believing, hate-mongering, intellectual garbage-spouting miscreants. We cannot let these people run a government. It'll be chaos and pain and completely ill-equipped to deal with the real issues Albertans face in transitioning our economy, fixing healthcare and education, dealing with and preparing for disasters, and so on. Most Albertans are just barely paying attention and think that voting conservative will be like the last 50 years. No biggie. Status quo. Hell no! Today's UCP needs to have its electoral ass handed to itself. It needs some time in the wilderness to find itself again. Release the monkeys back to their jungle. Oh boy. Get boring and competent. So no, this isn't as complicated as you have told yourself it is. Your friends, those awesome candidates, they'll be okay if they lose. Thousands of Albertans will not be okay if the UCP forms government. It really is that simple. You should be actively encouraging people to vote for anybody but the UCP and give them enough of an electoral thrashing that the message sticks. Enough is enough. The fire in the conservative movement is out of control. What are you doing to put it out? That from Tanya. Hey, if you're a conservative and you want to reply to that, you've got next Friday before the election to return fire, so to speak. And this one from Ned, who says, I'm sick of people treating politics like sports. If you want to follow and root for the Calgary Flames or the Edmonton Oilers, no matter what they do or how they finish in the standings, all the power to you. Cheer your heart out. You can't have the same approach when it comes to your politics. You can't blindly support someone time and time again just because of the party affiliation on your ballot. I see so many closed-minded people online that'll bash anything that they slightly disagree with as communism because of the corrupt liberal NDP coalition. It's time to grow up and face reality at some point. Now, am I saying that Justin Trudeau and Rachel Notley are perfect politicians that can do nothing wrong? Absolutely not. They definitely make mistakes. Anybody would, because we're human beings. Stop treating politicians of your preferred party as some higher being walking the earth amongst us like, I don't know, Donald Trump, who can do no wrong. Be a freaking adult and listen to and think about what the other side's proposing. Have a respectful, polite debate. Learn some concerns that the other side has instead of getting behind your keyboard in the Facebook comments and 
dropping heinous bullshit about politicians you don't like to your echo chamber because of the party they represent and the corruption you espouse that they represent as well. This Alberta election season, we need to take off our party bias goggles and deeply evaluate the NDP and the UCP for who they are and what they stand for before we go to the polls to decide the future of this province. That's from Nathan. You can send us your trash talk to talk at ryanjesperson.com. We're taking the holiday Monday off. We'll be back here live Tuesday with Charles Adler and a lot more election coverage leading up to May 29th. If you're a Real Talk Patreon supporter, don't forget to check your email. You still have a few days to enter to win a golden ticket to our election night VIP viewing party right here in the Real Talk studio. We'll see you Tuesday. Real Talk.